We'll move on to the next session, and, and it's about cardiomems in the real world. Um, and Bashar Hanavi is our advanced heart failure fellow who's going to present the cases and review the evidence. Bashar. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, hope you're having a great day. All right, so today we're gonna, uh, I'm going to uh, do a case uh, presentation uh, illustrate the use of cardiomems in patients with heart failure. We'll uh, give a, a brief background on heart, of, uh, heart failure and uh, its mortality. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, you know, cardiomems and the recent studies. <coughs> Start off with a pr uh, case presentation, 55-year-old male who has a plasmic history of heart failure reduced ejection fraction uh, from non-ischemic myopathy more than 10 years ago. Uh, he had a, a, a CRT um, defibrillator also implanted many years ago. He had atrial fibrillation. He had uh, cardioversion uh, more than three times, and he had two uh, prior AFib ablation. Uh, his uh, comorbid condition include uh, uh, insulin-dependent diabetes. He also has hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He's morbidly obese with BMI of 45. He has uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and he wore a CPAP at home. He uh, presented with worsening dyspnea resurgence, uh, orthopnea, and, uh, and PND. Also had bilateral leg, uh, leg edema. Uh, he denied uh, any recent history of infection. He had no recent atrial arrhythmia. He does uh, report uh, dietary uh, noncompliance. In the last 12 months, he had two hospitalizations for CHF, and he had uh, more hospitalization, hospitalization than year, years before. Uh, medication at home, he was on a meter on 200 milligram daily. He was on a uh, maximum dose of Coreg, uh, 25 milligram twice a day. He was also on hydralazine, 100 TID, aspirin, uh, Eliquis, and Torsamine. <coughs> uh, vitals, uh, blood pressure 118 over 90, uh, heart rate 78. He was morbidly obese, uh, had a regular rate of rhythm. He had a, um, a mitral regurgitation murmur uh, with uh, jugular venous distension. His chest were clear and he had bilateral edema. Uh, Perineal lab information include uh, um, uh, slightly uh, high potassium uh, with chronic kidney disease and creatinine 2.4. So this is uh, his echocardiography. Uh, included uh, uh, three views, uh, two ep epical, uh, four and two chambers, and uh, the personal lung axis. So as you can see, he has a severe biventricular systolic dysfunction. Um, this is the, uh, this over here, the, his mitral inflow velocity, uh, very high e, uh, e velocity with a small a, that uh, indicate a restrictive uh, pattern with a high wedge uh, estimated more than 25. Uh, this is IVC that uh, is dilated and doesn't collapse with uh, inspiration indicating a high RI pressure. <clears throat> so before you move on, uh, I think Jew and Nadia. So a guy with prolonged history of heart failure, two hospitalizations, looking at that echo, what what are what are your thoughts? What what are we thinking? Well, uh, first of all, yes, he's uh, morbidly obese. So of course, uh, I think the the challenge of a clinical exam, uh, uh, figuring out what his volume status is um, is going to be problematic. However, if you go back to the medications, um, uh, Bashar, his, he still has blood pressure room and we could potentially do more uh, optimization of the medications, uh, especially with carvitolol, and we could obviously add a nitrate to hydralazine combination. I'm not sure why he's on um, aspirin, but um, um, but ha having said that, yes, uh, some room in the optimization of the medication therapy and then looking at the echocardiogram, his LV size, um, I'm not sure if index to his body if it's that big, but uh, clearly uh, the diastolic dysfunction is there with uh, quite a restrictive uh, pattern of flow and non-collapsing um, IVC. Um, I'm not sure if he had significant MR or uh, Mild DR. MR. Mild MR. Okay. Um, and uh, did he need a CRT or? He has a CRT. Yes. He has a CRT. Okay. Do you have any thoughts? Just smelling badness. 
Yeah. Smell, smelling, smelling badness. badness. Uh, that's the conclusion. <laughs> No, but I agree. You know, any time we we see folks who are on uh, um, guideline directed therapy, as Nadia mentioned, you know, we try to maximize them on on, on the guideline directed medical therapy as much as possible. But despite that, if he's having recurrent hospitalizations, that's certainly a red flag. Um, and, and also with uh, uh, renal dysfunction, um, something to to consider as features for advanced heart failure and, and needing a, a potentially end organ intervention. Um, but uh, with, in terms of uh, the, the role for cardiomems in this patient, I think also has to do with the fact that volume status uh, may, may be challenging. Um, Bashar writes that the patient does have jugular venous distension on exam, which is, which is helpful. Um, <clears throat> uh, but if, if in, the, in the times that it's challenging or if we can try and avoid uh, recurrent hospitalizations by remotely monitoring their volume status, uh, it may be helpful. Okay, so because he had, um, he had a lot of risk factors for coronary artery disease and his EF uh, remained depressed, so we wanted to make sure there's no um, uh, severe coronary artery disease needing revascularization. So he had uh, a coronary angiogram, and uh, the first, first view over here is this is an, an AP caudal. It stopped working, but basically, uh, LAD circ circ is is large and there's no significant coronary artery disease, maybe mild non-obstructive in the coronary in the in the RCA. Also had a right heart catheterization and go over the numbers. His RA pressure was 24. Uh, he had uh, severe pulmonary hypertension with a mean PA pressure of 49. Uh, this is all wedge driven uh, with a wedge pressure of 40 and uh, the stellar pressure gradient of only two. Uh, his cardiac uh, output was 4. Remember, his BMI was 45, so that would give him a cardiac index of 1.4. So the question to the panel, what should you do next? MAP was around 100, so SBR a little over 1,500. Yeah, so I think you know, advanced heart failure always comes to your mind first in these individuals, and then that categorization is important because you need to start thinking you know, have, have I done everything else and should we be talking about transplants, LVADs in these individuals? There are problems with this BMI, so that's going to be an issue. But a, a wedge of 40, and as Nadia was pointing out, when you're obese with the BMI of 45, uh, no matter how good you are, it's going to be tough for you to keep an eye on an S3 and, and volume assessment, uh, and more often than not, uh, it's it's impossible to keep individuals you will make. And that index of 1.4 um, is quite bad. So if the wedge is high and the index is low, I would go with the primary strategy of diuresing them to see if the index improves. Because sometimes you can decompress the LV and shift the Starling curve to a point of improving contractility. Uh, but if you do that and you don't improve the index, then it's not much of the volume problem. It's, it's just a bad heart. I mean, it perpetuates both of it. But volume can make you have a depressed myocardial state. And we've seen this multiple times. You decompress the LV, the wedge gets better. The, the contractility also can improve uh, because of the, the load. Yes, I mean, in, in his uh, scenario, Bashar uh, uh, mentioned the SVR is 1,500 or so. Um, it, it will be challenging just to diurese him with IV without a support of something else, meaning an IV vasodilator, probably be better choice to assist the diuresis. And looking at a, a little more longer term may even show or demonstrate if his kidney function improves with that in, in strategizing for advanced therapies or mechanical circulatory support if he needs it. But, but at this point, it seems like he has enough risk factors for any kind of end organ intervention, whether it's heart transplant or mechanical circulatory support, like an LVAD implant surgery, is, he's at an incredibly high risk for mm -hmm. uh, given his comorbidity. So um, in addition to all the medical therapies that we would do, diuresis, optimizing his guideline-directed therapies, I think um, uh, putting in a strategy where we can potentially better monitor his uh, uh, pulmonary pressures and, and his filling pressures uh, may be beneficial for him. 
So I'm going to uh, talk about a little, a little bit about heart failure, and then we'll go back to the case. Uh, heart failure in the last few years has become a major issue in the United States. Uh, it's affecting 6.5 million Americans. Uh, this uh, is going to increase with time. It is estimated around uh, 20, 2030 that uh, between 2.5 to 3.5 of the population uh, will have heart failure. <clears throat> this also comes with a high cost of mortality. Uh, this is a study, more than 50,000 patients uh, registry with their uh, first diagnosis of heart failure. Uh, as you can see, 80% uh, uh, survival rate after one year, and that decreased progressively to only 30% after 10 years of diagnosis. Uh, more hospitalization for heart failure lead towards outcomes. Uh, this particular uh, study, a Canadian registry, more than, uh, I believe, 10,000 10, patients. Uh, the more hospitalization for CHF, uh, the worse the survival is. After uh, one hospitalization for CHF, the median survival was 2.4, progressively decreased to only a uh, little over uh, six months uh, after the fourth hospitalization. <clears throat> this is uh, some data from uh, Gupta et al. Uh, it is on Medicare patients. Uh, as uh, you can see, um, in the last few years, uh, although readmission for heart failure did improve, uh, uh, mortality actually worsened at 30 days on one year outcomes. So there is more than uh, heart failure hospitalization and, uh, and mortality. Uh, this is uh, data that come from ESCAPE trial uh, that looked at uh, patients hospitalized, hospitalized for CHF who were uh, managed with uh, swan-directed medical therapy versus their regular care. And they separated the patient to, um, based on their cardiac index and based, based on their wedge pressure. A uh, patient who had a, a persistent elevated wedge pressure at the final number before they took out the swan did much poorly uh, compared to the uh, other patient. Cardiac index did not make any difference. So congestion uh, remain a very important cause of uh, heart failure readmissions. Uh, this, is, uh, this is data from the VMAX study, uh, which uh, compared nitroglycerin and niseratide. Uh, most patients who are admitted uh, with uh, CHF have a high filling pressure with estimated wedge pressure between 25 and 30, despite the normal cardiac index. <clears throat> um, so what's the problem here? Uh, we've known for a while, since probably 1980s, that our physical exam and, and x-rays are not uh, very good at detecting congestion. In this uh, particular study, uh, Raul's edema and high JVD was only, were only present in 42% of patients who had an elevated wedge pressure more than 22. And the same uh, chest x-ray did not show any signs of congestion in patients who had a high uh, wedge pressure more than 25 in third of the cases. Uh, this, is, uh, this is some data from um, intracardiac um, uh, pressure mon monitoring system. Uh, this is the Medtronic system. And as you can see, um, the, the pressure, this is a, a systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. And this is the estimated uh, 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 PA diastolic pressure. Uh, so the, the pressure actually increased over the last uh, few days prior to hospitalization until it become uh, very elevated. And then the patient gets hospitalized. And then uh, uh, the pressure improved with diuresis. Uh, however, this study did not show any uh, benefit in uh, a reduction of hus uh, heart failure hospitalization. Uh, this was until uh, the CHAMPION trial came by. And so I think, Bashar, just a quick point in the data that you showed. I, I think a couple of <clears throat> things that to reflect on is to acknowledge the fact that congestion is not always obvious. And there's actually a classification and a spectrum of congestion. When we talk about congestion, for the most part, we're thinking about left atrial pressure and left ventricular end diastolic pressure. We're not talking about RV failure. It's a whole other discussion. Here, it's mostly short of breath, left atrial pressure, LV pressure. The spectrum of congestion is there's a preclinical congestion where patients are completely asymptomatic. There's no evidence of curly B lines, curly A lines on the X-ray. They're not short of breath, but these are the patients that sometimes walk into the cath lab, we do a right heart catheterization, and their wedge is 30, but they say they're walking two miles, they feel great. 
and that's completely asymptomatic congestion. And why does that happen? Because your body adapts, you've got lymphatics that takes it out. The perception of shortness of breath is based on a receptor pathway that goes from the lungs. So there's so many variables. Just like there are stoics who don't feel pain and others who are wimps, there's a spectrum of perception of shortness of breath, right? So that has to be acknowledged. Then you progress to a situation where your radiologist calls congestion, the filling pressures are high, of course, but the patient doesn't feel bad. So they're still asymptomatic. And then starts your progression to a clinical symptomatic congestion. And that spectrum varies at least for 15 to 30 days based on studies, even if somebody starts their journey from having normal pressures. And that's what Bashar was a student pointing out, that the filling pressures can be high but we can still miss it and think people are okay and they go home and of course they'll come back. Uh, and another important point to remember in all that he talked about is there is admissions to the hospital and there is acute heart failure exacerbations. What we are more concerned about is heart failure exacerbation and high pressures. Just because somebody is sitting in your office and doesn't like coming into the ER and they're short of breath doesn't mean that they're not congested. And if someone who's a heart failure patient comes into the hospital because of a toe infection, that admission is not relevant to what we're talking about. So these admission readmissions have become kind of a hot topic of discussion for economic reasons. But we have to distinguish that from an admission is because of heart failure exacerbation and you want to avoid the filling pressures going up. Yeah, I think that you can... So the champion trial used the Carimem device. It's a very small sensor. Uh, they, we can implant in the cath lab, uh, right femoral vein access. Uh, take, after we do the right heart catheterization, take around like 10 minutes to deploy. Um, and this is the baseline of the study. What I want to point out, I mean, everything was about the same as other study, mostly ischemic patient. Um, the, you know, the age was about 60. Uh, they were on very good dose of uh, medication, uh, beta blocker, diuretics, ACE, and, um, and ARP. Uh, the BMI in the study was around uh, 31, and the mean uh, GFR was around 60. So this patient has some degree of uh, chronic kidney disease. Uh, this is the outcome. So patient who had access to, okay, so the, the channel I did not mention is uh, 550 uh, patients, uh, any kind of heart failure regardless of, uh, of uh, LVEF who had at least one hospitalization for CHF in the last 12 months, who had uh, NYHA class uh, three symptoms. So patients who were implanted with a uh, sensor and they used that sensor to guide their uh, medical therapy had a significant reduction in their admission uh, to the hospital with heart failure exacerbation. And this is uh, the continuing uh, access. So basically after the study was, was done, open access, patients who were in the control uh, got access to, to the pressure sensor and they used it to uh, change their medication. They had a uh, 21% uh, reduction uh, in, their, uh, in their old cause admission to the hospital and 48% reduction in their heart, heart failure hospitalization compared to when they did not have access to those uh, data. So can we do that in medical, in, medic, in daily practice? And the answer is yes, this is uh, uh, Medicare data. Uh, when we, uh, so after the FDA approved uh, the CardioMEMS, they used all, all the patient from 2014 to 2015, I believe. And as you can see, so it's almost you know, similar to the, to, to the trial, uh, significant reduction in, in heart failure admission, um, about uh, uh, 45% at six months and uh, around like 35% at 12 months. Uh, this also came with a lower uh, cost of uh, heart failure related admission, uh, saving around like $7,500 uh, uh, in, in the first six months. Uh, so how can we achieve that? There is a, a concept that I want to introduce, it's called optivolemic, and that's what they use in the trial. And you can use the PA pressure, the systolic mean and diastolic pressure to guide medical therapy. So if you have, uh, sorry, so if you have a high filling pressure, you can uh, start with adding diuresis or IV diuresis or adding a thiazide diuretics. If it remain elevated uh, after reassessing for a week, you can add after low reduction like nitrate or, hydro or hydrolysis. 
Uh, this is the change in, in medication in, in, the, in the study, as you can see. Um, more, a lot more patients had change in medication. Uh, this was mainly uh, changing loop diuretics uh, and, and, and vasodilator therapy, like uh, nitrate and hydroazine, but also ACE uh, and, and ARB and beta blocker both were uh, changed a lot more often, increased a lot more often in the, in the, in the study patients. Uh, a special patient population that I want to mention, uh, COPD patient, a lot of time they come back to the hospital, we're not sure why they're short of breath. Um, and, and this uh, subgroup analysis of the champion showed a significant reduction in 41% of their heart failure rate admission and 62% of respiratory admission. So if we go back to our patient, so he was not interested in pursuing advanced therapy. Um, so we uh, implanted a cardiac maps. Uh, the first picture you can see, sorry, you can see the pulmonary angiogram, and then you can identify where you want to uh, put the cardiomems in, and then you can uh, you can implant it. Uh, this is from the Merlin. Um, but but sure, just go back <laughs> once, for, so that I, I mean, if, if all of if you're not familiar with the cardiomem system, it, the sensor that Bashar showed earlier is what you see up there. If you want to point out essentially comes as a preloaded sensor onto a catheter, just like how stents come preloaded. And we're, we just find the right spot in the pulmonary artery, and it gets deployed there and sticks to the wall. No wires, no batteries, everything comes out. And then you go home, there's an antenna and a pillow. So the patient lays on the pillow, presses a button, essentially you're getting the PA pressures at that instance that gets transmitted into the website, which he's gonna show on the next, uh, the next slide. So just like you leave a Swangans catheter in the ICU and monitor PA pressures constantly, this is giving you a PA reading, not constantly, but every time they interrogate the device, which we typically recommend once a day. So that's how that, uh, the website looks. So this is, we're sitting in our remote monitoring clinic and we can actually get alerts on our phone. You can open up the website on the phone, and that red line is a systolic, and green is the diastolic, and blue is the mean. Right? Yes. Yeah. And then you can you can change uh, the time when you want to see you know your data from the time of implantation until like years later. You can put them all in a graph, and then you can do like little notes. Uh, like, you know, this patient, for example, for example, here, you know, they had a high PA diastolic pressure, so there's a note that the patient was administered more diuretics and, you know, dropped down. And then you can do, uh, you know, this patient that like, was hospitalized at some point, and you, you can put a note at, you know, their PA diastolic pressure when they were admitted to the hospital, et cetera. And then uh, you can make it, you know, shorter. This is, for example, uh, over 30 days period. And then if you have any question about, you know, like a reading that doesn't make sense to you, you can click on it and then you can see the actual tracing. Uh, sometimes you can you may get like an inaccurate tracing or something like that. So you can confirm it right here. So the tracing at the bottom is essentially <coughs> the PA waveform that you normally see on the screen but in a bedside. But ideally you should be looking at the PA waveform and interpreting the PA diastolic. And that's what you're treating and all the trial that data that he showed is when, when people use this and not just relied on patient symptoms, they were able to adjust medications in a better way and keep them out of the hospital. Kind of makes common sense logic that if you maintain pressures lower, you don't come back into the hospital. But interestingly, the data that he showed, if you noticed, they were also able to up titrate not just diuretics, but also after load reduction medications because if your pressures are high, your blood pressure could be high. And people ended up on more uh, meds for heart failure than, than not, and not just diuretic adjust. Thank you very much. Any questions, uh, discussions? I think we have about three, four minutes. Any, any comments? So it's approved for indications. Cardiomems right now is approved for indication of NYHA class three symptoms, despite pers despite ap appropriate guideline directed treatment. And then uh, 
one hospitalization in the last year. If you have both of them, you qualify to get cardiomyopathy based on FDA uh, recommendation. And that's a very good question. Which brings us to this. Because CMS reimburses everywhere else except Texas and Florida. <laughs> and, and it's very fascinating how this system works because the agency that disperses CMS funds for Texas area is called as Novitas, and there's another one in Florida. They independently have the governance of dispersing funds. Uh, when FDA approved it, so it's FDA approved, um, after a year or so, they suddenly looked at it and said, it's only one trial, we're not gonna pay for it. So right now in Texas, we can't get it for Medicare patients, except for a trial that we're doing where the company is able to negotiate with Medicare saying if they meet criteria to the trial, which essentially is what was approved for, and less sicker patients, you can enroll into the trial and get it right now. Hopefully at some point they'll reverse it. Any adverse events? So the complication rate, um, and I think there have been about more than 10,000 implants since it's been approved, and complication rate is quite minuscule, mostly vascular related, which is also like less than 1%. There's probably one case where they reported a P PE, but for the most part, it's a safe device. It gets endothelialized, even when it embolizes further distal We've had one or two patients where it occludes the distal artery, but there's no, they're asymptomatic. We've had some patients who've gotten a VAD after, gotten a transplant after, uh, and the cardiomyopathy remains in there, not really too many uh, problems. VAD-supported patients, uh, yes, so we've had, we've put in cardiomyopathy in a few VAD patients because of inability to uh, optimize their volume status, uh, mostly because of obesity. There's a trial called Intellect Trial, which was looking at how can we use uh, cardiomyms in VAD patients. Anticoagulation, patients need to go on um, aspirin and Plavix for a month, followed by after a month, they just go back to aspirin. If they're taking Coumadin or Novax, they don't need to take either one. Why is this not first-line standard of care for all stage three patients to prophylactically treat the sequelae of heart failure? It's a very good question. That's good so question. that's the um, that's the proposition with the new trial called as Guide HF trial, where they're looking at NYHH class two to class uh, four patients to see if you prophylactically maintain low pressures, whether it will help or not. But until proven, right now it's for much sicker patients as effective in reducing admissions for obese patients and those with CKD? Uh, CKD is a actually a good question because it helps in patients with low GFR, but the trial excluded patients whose GFR was less than 25. It makes sense because if you're close to getting on dialysis, your diuretics are not gonna work because the whole concept is to. Right, I think we're all up, up for time. Thank you, thanks for.